Thy word is strength. Thy word is power. Lord, your word is force. And your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Hi, and welcome in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to our table here at Bible Talk where each week we gather to feed on the Word of God, feast on the Word of God. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Yum, yum. We are continuing in our study, our ongoing study, in Paul's first letter to the church at Thessalonica. 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 Okay? <laughs> now, this is our ninth chapter, so to speak, our ninth week in this study. And we'll be continuing on in uh, the third chapter, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, and we're going to start at verse 12. But before we do that, I'm going to ask Brother Mark here to lead us in a prayer. Oh Lord, we just are thankful that we have the ability to get together and study your word. Just open our eyes and our hearts to see what is in it for us to see and apply to our lives. For this is, and also... Grant us the understanding of how much this is worth to us. Your word. Amen. Amen. Well, yeah, before we start, I just want to remind you once again that um, the Bible studies, after we do them, are available online, on demand, on the Bible Talk website. And we encourage you to drop us a little email at office at BibleTalk.com with any comments or suggestions or questions you might have. We'd just love to hear from you, find out where you're viewing this from. So stay in touch. We just are blessed to be able to get together with you through this technology. And you uh, also can go to Facebook if you put in and do a search for Bible Talk. We have uh, a couple of pages up and you can make comments there. Find stuff there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. So as I said, we were in First Thessalonians. And we left off last week in uh, chapter three, uh, chapter three, verse twelve, where we were talking about Paul and his desire to get back over to Thessalonica. All right, and I'm going to pick it up in verse twelve. I'm going to read verse twelve and thirteen. And may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people, just as we also do for you so that he may establish your hearts without blame and holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Uh, again, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, maybe joining us for the first time, uh, I'm reading from the New American Standard. Um, any version you use is fine, as, but it should sound similar to what I'm reading here. All right. If you have questions about your version or translation of the Bible, Again, write to me. I, I'd love to discuss that. All right. So Paul is writing here, May the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another. Love for one another. You know, Jesus said in John thirteen thirty four, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Okay? Paul wrote, and he wrote to his son in the faith, Timothy, 1 Timothy 1.5, and he said, The goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and sincere faith. Now, this is really important because, you know, why are you here at a Bible study? I mean, I'm blessed that you're here. Uh, but some people get into the Word because they're going and looking for, you know, they, they want to find out what the quote-unquote promises are so they can get stuff. Some want it, whatever the reason. But... Paul says there's one reason for getting into the Word. And that's the goal of our instruction is love. Well, of course, God is love. Jesus Christ is the expression of the Father's love, all right? So when we study the Word, we are studying the Word, capital W, the Word made flesh who dwelt among us. We're studying Jesus Christ because He is love. And to grow closer and closer to Him, that we might know more and more how to love others, all right? A lot of people going, now let me, let's be perfectly clear on this. You know, the Word of God says, Paul wrote to the church in Romans, in Romans chapter 10, he said, that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. 
So in our studies and everything, part of the effect of that should be to grow in our faith. But the goal is love. You know, I was thinking about this when I was praying a little bit earlier. Alice and I have been blessed, you know, we, we have traveled all over the place. All over the place. Uh, but here in the United States, we've traveled all over the United States. And there have been quite a few times we've had the opportunity, and I'll, I'll put it that way, to, tra to drive cross-country. Um, and let, let, I'll just give you an example of what ran through my mind. One time, living here in Florida, we were on our way out to California. So our goal was to get to California. We were going out there. Actually, I'm, I'm thinking of a time when we went out there to start a new ministry, which was the M.D. Solomon Institute, uh, our, our teaching on the application of God's Word in the workplace, right? So we were going out there for that purpose. Um, well, you know, our goal was to get to, we were headed from Modesto, California, where was where we were going. So we drove from, uh, I guess we were in Orlando, or Naples, Naples, Florida. And we stopped in Dallas, Texas, to visit friends and family. And then we drove up through Colorado Springs and across uh, through the mountains. So we got the mountains, of course, I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to drive through that area, through Colorado into uh, Utah and into Nevada. It's breathtaking. Breathtaking is the right word. I mean, it is incredible to see what God has created. It's just so, it can yeah. bring you to tears. So, so beautiful. It, but the point that I'm trying to make here is we were blessed and we had other things along the way. Mm -hmm. But the goal was always, and the, our focus was always, to get to this place in California to start that ministry. Right. And it's the same way here. Our goal is love. Now, you can get blessed with a lot of other stuff along the way. Mm -hmm. But the purpose is love. The purpose is not for you to grow in faith so you can get stuff. The purpose is not to find out what the promises of God are for your particular life. All those, thing, all those, those things are there. And yes, you will get them. But that's not the goal. That's not the purpose. The purpose is love. Okay? One of the things I was thinking about here when I was... Um, praying about this and making my my notes today. He said that he wants to establish our hearts without blame and holiness. You know what? When you're without blame and holiness, there's another word for that. It's righteousness. And as I was thinking about that, because you can't, I want to get this balance. You know, it says in Proverbs 11 that an unjust balance is an abomination to the Lord. You can't, anything not done in faith is sin. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. But the goal is love. You know, Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, and I'm sure you've, you've known this. In, in Ephesians chapter 6, he talks about putting on the whole armor of God. Right? And when he talks about the whole armor of God in Ephesians 6, in the 14th verse, chapter 6, verse 14, he talks about the breastplate of righteousness. Right? But here in this letter to the Thessalonians, in the fifth chapter, and we'll get to this, he talks about the breastplate in verse 8. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 8 says, But since we're the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love. Now I'm going to use a term, I hope I don't lose you on this. Don't fall asleep, don't get bored, don't fall asleep. I talk about what I think is a law of equivalency. I talk about logic. I love logic. Now, I'm not talking about worldly wisdom. I'm talking about logic that is virtually only found in the Word of God. Okay? But God created things, so there's, you can find this in other places. For example, the law of equivalency. If 4 equals 2 plus 2, and it does, and 4 equals... 3 plus 1, right? Mm -hmm. Then equivalency says, logic demands that 2 plus 2 must equal 3 plus 1. Mm -hmm. Okay? Did, did you get that? Did you get that? Yes. Okay. If, if 4 equals 2 plus 2 and 4 also equals 3 plus 1, then 2 plus 2 must equal 3 plus 1. Mm. If this breastplate that the Spirit of God moved Paul to write about is a breastplate of righteousness. And breastplate equals righteousness, and breastplate equals love and faith, 
then righteousness must equal faith plus love. Okay? Righteousness is that combination of faith and love. And if you, if you lack faith, well, you want to know something? You have no righteousness. But more importantly, if you lack love, you have no righteousness. You got, they have to be there paired. They have to be there. It's, it's almost like an atom where you got parts of the atom. Don't, don't go there, Mark. So you got this, I mean, they, they have to be there. They have to be locked together. Because if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and Paul talks about faith and love. And he, but he says this, he says, if you have love, if you have faith, if you have faith to move mountains, but you don't have love, you've got nothing. So you're nothing but a noisy gong, a, a clanging cymbal. If you don't, if you, you have to have both. You have to have both faith and love. That's what righteousness is all about, okay? And they have to be balanced out with one another. Okay, that, that's really important. You call that the law of the equivalency. I mean, it's, and you know what? Uh, it, I, it's worth your while to give that some thought after this yeah, Bible study. That's a good chew on. It, because it's not just here, but there are quite a few places in the Scripture where there are different accounts. You know, the, the Gospels are basically called synoptic Gospels. That's because Matthew, Mark, and Luke tend to, to give accounts of the same events. So if you see one, you, you know, one will give you insight into the other. There are places uh, in, in other parts of the Bible where First and Second Kings are synoptic to First and Second Chronicles. So they give you different views of the same events. And there are different places there where you'll see one, I mean, they're, you know, they're, one's not contradicting the other. The Bible interprets the Bible. And they're often, often it'll give you insight into the mind of God and the heart of God when you see these things. As here, with righteousness being by the law of equivalency, by logic, it is that combination of faith and love together. Right? I believe in mathematics it's either the associative rule or the commutative rule. I'll take associative. One, one of those two. I'll take associative. So you can look that up. And it's in algebra, basic algebra. Yeah, well, see, you know, oh, gee, all those people just turned us off. <laughs> you hated algebra in school, I know. Don't worry about it. Let God give you revelation. Father, open the eyes of our hearts that we see wonderful things in your word. But it's, it's important to let the Bible explain the Bible. Okay? Um, let, me, let me go on. All right. So he says his purpose was, and he's praying, his prayer is that God would cause these people in Thessalonica, that Paul was responsible for starting that church, to abound in love for one another. All right? Because this is what it's about. We're supposed to love one another. That's the commandment of God. The new commandment of Jesus Christ is what he said. But he goes on to say, and for all people. Now, this is really, really important. And I promise you, this is something that is really significant in this particular day and age. Of course, it was important then and significant then, but all the more now. Listen to what Jesus said here, right? This is from Luke chapter 6, verse 32. Jesus said, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. Then in the Sermon on the Mount, all right, I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to read from verse 43 to 48. Please listen to this. Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. And pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax gatherers do the same. If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. Therefore you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. We are not just to love, we are to love the, the brethren, okay? And by the way, our love should go to them first, okay? It goes to, doing good goes to the household of God first. That's, you'll find in Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. 
and judgment comes to the household of, of God first. Find that in First Peter uh, chapter 4, verse 17. God sent the gospel to the Jew first, then the Gentile. You know, there's this order. God is a God of good order, right? So while, yes, it's supposed to go to our own household, because love radiates outwards. So it, it goes out from those the closest to you, but it doesn't stop. It doesn't stop. Now, here, listen to what I'm going to tell you. Your love doesn't is not supposed to stop once it leaves the boundaries of your church and hits a Muslim or a Buddhist. But one of the things there's a problem with that we have, it's a purple grass problem, because when you say love, immediately comes to mind is the emotions. Well, we're what going to talk you about, yes. about that. Right. We're going to talk about that. That is, you're absolutely right. That's the root of the problem that we have. Right. Is that we're being driven and, and moved by our feelings and rather emotions. than by, and our emotions, by feelings and emotions rather than by the Word of God and the Spirit of God. And that's what I want to talk about. You know, who are you supposed to love? Let me ask you this. Who are you not supposed to love? Exactly. Now, I don't think that there's anything in Scripture that demands you love the devil. Okay? Yeah. We're talking about human beings. B-E-A-N-S. Okay? Because our warfare is not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. Our warfare is against that adversary who rebelled against God irreversibly. Okay? But where is the love of a Christian supposed to stop? Well, then how do I see, just recently... For example, when Saddam, or not Saddam, uh, Osama bin Laden was killed. And by the way, I, I, I've got to get into this, so don't get too ahead of me here. When Osama bin Laden was killed, people were dancing in the streets in the West, celebrating that. Okay, I can't comment on that. Other than the fact, if you're a Christian, and you were dancing in the streets, if your heart was leaping with joy, then you want to know something? Your heart is not right. It says, do not rejoice when your enemy stumbles. It says in Proverbs, do not That's rejoice right. when your enemy falls. So, but the thing is, what is the heart of God the Father? The heart of God the Father is his desire, Peter wrote, is that none should perish, but all come to everlasting life. Let me tell you something. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he died on the cross for Osama bin Laden. When he prayed a prayer and said, Father, forgive him, he was praying for Osama bin Laden. Oh, praise God, he was praying for me. Thank God he was praying for you. He was praying for all of us. But he was praying, it says that be, the first thing John the Baptist said was, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the nice people. No, he didn't say that. He said, okay, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the Jews. Jews were supposed to go out to everybody. What John the Baptist said was, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. There is a place for people to deal with evildoers like Osama bin Laden. That is the God-given ministry of the government. It says that the governors have been given the sword to punish evildoers. That's their ministry. It's not our ministry. It is not the ministry of the church. The ministry of the church is reconciliation. Yes. The ministry of the church is that what we use as a tagline here at Bible Talk. That we proclaim the word of God powered by the love of God. That's our ministry. To, to, to beg people, to plead with people, to be reconciled to God the Father. I'm just thinking about that. That, that God had a part in this and he's done his part. He's forgiven everyone in the world. That's already been done. So now it's up to the people to make a choice. But it's up to us to bring that choice to them. Right. But see, what you're saying, you're absolutely right. It's a choice twice. Because first of all, you know, it says that those, Paul wrote again in Romans, and he says that those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how will they call upon the name of the Lord if they've not heard about him, if they don't believe him? How are they going to believe if they haven't heard? And how are they going to hear if it's not been preached? And how is it going to be preached if they're not sent? So God has sent people 
but he sent all of us. Mm -hmm. Because we are all, all believers. Peter wrote in, in, his, in his first letter that we are called to proclaim the excellencies of him who has called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. All right? mm -hmm. So we all have this ministry of sharing the love of God. But that's a choice that you have to make. And listen, think about the verses we just talked about. It's not a matter of loving the people who are lovable. No. It's not a matter of loving the people no. who are likable. No. It is about, and this is what Christ was so different than everybody. I mean, he went out and touched and, and loved the lepers, the brokenhearted. This is how he started his ministry, reading from Isaiah 61. He came to heal the brokenhearted. He came to set the captives free. You know, and, and now the church is sitting back in its lofty, beautiful buildings and talking, pointing the finger of judgment out the door of their building and not loving those who are out in the streets. We need to, I'm sorry, we need to love. You know what the problem is? Let, let the White House and the Defense Department figure out how to deal with radical, fanatical is Islam. But how should you deal with it as a Christian? You should be praying for those people, praying for their salvation. You should, on every opportunity, be bringing the love of God to them, a real love. But this goes back to what Alice was saying. And what Alice was saying is that love is not an emotion, it's not a feeling. Now, this is what I almost like what I was saying before about the goal and the trip. Right. You know, when you when you are headed for that goal, other things and good things can happen. You can choosing to love somebody, maybe the emotions and the feelings will follow. But they shouldn't be dependent on it. Let me, let me just, because I'm, this is all going through my mind as you're saying it, that the fact of, again, it's not the emotion, it's not the, that feeling of love that we're trying to bring to, to the enemy, because you can't, I mean, you just can't, you can't have that emotion when they're standing there and being what they are. The, the, the love that we're bringing to them is the Word of God, is Jesus Christ. But, That's yeah. the love that we have to give them. That's the love that we have to show them. It has nothing to do with us, not an emotion. We can, we can bring that love to them, and then they make the choice. And then the emotion, like you said, could come later. It's because when, when, they accept, it may come later. Yeah, yes. when they accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, there is an emotion. And an emotion in us that we, we want to embrace them. We want, we're excited, we're even happy. Even if, my point is, even if they don't accept them. Even if they don't. We still have to love them. Yes. We still have to be doing that love. And now, let me we just... We don't give up on them. No, but let me say this. You can't do it. No, we can't. Not with your love. No. It However, love. the love of God, Paul says in Romans chapter 5, verse 5, he says that the love of God, God's love, has been poured into our hearts through His Holy Spirit. That's right. So God has empowered us to love the unlovable. Right? You know... A, a few years ago, I don't remember how long ago it was, but not not very distant past, a very uh, significant religious Christian leader here in the United States called for the assassination of a world leader. Yes, yes. That's an abomination. Yes. Yes. Let me just, that is an abomination. Now, if, if the United States government wants to do something about that, that's between them and God. But our ministry as Christians is to pray for that person. You know, it says that we're to pray for those who are in authority. Everybody in authority? Absolutely. Absolutely. We're, to, we're to love everybody. Yes, we are to love those inside the household of God. That's what it says here. Mm -hmm. Love for one another. we got to abound in love. Abound means, boy, this is, abound is the same word as abundant. Right? right? you got to have this abundance. you got to have this incredible abundance of love for one another. Yes. And for all people. Why do you think the Word of God goes and says, why do you think the Holy Spirit moved Paul to say, and all people? That's all of those people that are doing bad. That's all of those people who are doing evil. When Jesus Christ hung on that cross, beaten beyond recognition, mocked, spit upon, thorns placed into his head, do you think that he felt nice about the people that had just driven those nails through the palms of his hands and his feet? Do you think he felt nice about the guy who stuck a spear in him? He chose to love them. He chose to pray on their behalf in spite of his mistreatment at their hands. 
And I believe God can give you that feeling for them. Well, of but it, it, that, that will follow. Yes. Okay. Yeah. If if you're waiting to get the the feeling, and then you'll choose to love them, you get it backwards. Yeah. That's the tail wagging the dog, and it's yeah. not going to happen. That's right. Right. You got to choose to love them, and then God can work on your heart to change the way you feel about them. Right. And I promise you, I promise Absolutely. you, I promise you, I promise you, in the name of Jesus Christ, if you start praying for those people that you find unlovable, God will change the way you feel about them. Right. That is a promise that I make to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. One of the um, you know, if you're if you're disciplining your child, it says in Proverbs that rebellion is no no rebellion is in the heart of the child, and a rod yes. will yes. foolishness is found up in the heart, in the heart of the of child. child. And the rod discipline drive it far from you. Yes. Now it's hard to discipline your kid because you love him, but if if your child is rebellious. There's open warfare between you and that child, yes. and it can get kind of ugly. All right, but, but, and you've got to deal with that. But, but part of the problem is you're saying if you discipline... No, I'm saying you have to discipline appropriately. Oh, no, because what the Word of God says in, in Hebrews chapter 12, it says God disciplines us no, because he loves us. Disciplines right. those okay. he loves. Yes, it's because of it. And it says if he doesn't discipline you, it's like you're not his king. Right. So, you know, this is the difference between the world's understanding of discipline and what Christians should understand as discipline. And all too often, the church doesn't understand discipline. It is not punishment. It is not... It's training. You know, it is training. It is discipleship. Yes. Discipleship, discipline. Do you notice the similarity between the words? Uh, hello. All right, let me let me go on here. This is I mean it's just fascinating. We could spend I could spend because I love the word of God. I could spend days just talking about this subject. But but let let's just go on here. It says so that he may establish your hearts without blame and in holiness. That is righteousness. This is God's purpose. All right, is to establish you in this righteousness. What is the righteousness? It's that combination of love and faith. Now, I, I think this is interesting. If, for those of you who are reading the King James Bible, you probably can see this. If you look down at your Bible, you will see that the word that I have is establish. The old King James calls establish. establish. It doesn't have the E in front of it, right? Because mm -hmm. that's the ancient or the older word. And that word in Greek is esterizo. And it, what it literally means, and maybe you can see this better in the King James Version, to establish is because what it means in Greek is to stabilize. Mm -hmm. All right? Or to set fast. Now, earlier, last week, we talked about uh, the word disturbed in chapter 3, verse 3. Just go, go back there uh, real quickly. And it says, so that no one would be disturbed by afflictions. All right? And we talked about the fact that that word was like the wagging of a dog's tail. Right. It goes from here to there and there and it does it just doesn't stop moving. It's never steadfast. it's never it's never pardon you? Steadfast. It should be steadfast. Yeah, and that's exactly the opposite, opposite. of steadfast. Mm -hmm. In other words, instead of being stable, instead of being steadfast, mm -hmm. it's in constant movement, right? So love is supposed to be stable. Love is supposed to be steadfast. I remember from the days when I went to uh, the seminary, this is a, just a fascinating word. I'm going to read to you from Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. It says, God spoke and says, and again, this is the uh, New American Standard. God says, for I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice, and in the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. All right? Got that? Mm -hmm. I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice. And the Hebrew word there... Uh, is chesed, that's the Hebrew word. And in the King James it's translated mercy. I think the English Standard Version of the Bible uh, gets it most accurately because it, it translates it as steadfast love. I delight in steadfast love, right? Mm -hmm. That Hebrew word chesed, I'm going to tell you that Bible scholars and f have complained that the word, it's very difficult to translate. 
how do you translate this word into English? Because it really has no precise equivalent in our language. Going back to equivalence. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's just kind of a scary thought. Because what that actually means, if you stop and think about it, is that this concept, this Hebrew concept that God spoke to his people thousands of years ago, we've lost in our language. Yes, yes. We don't even understand, we don't have a right word to explain what God was expressing when he talks about his love, by the way, is steadfast. Nothing changes his love for us. Mm -hmm. Okay? No matter what you do. No matter what you do, nothing changes God's, God's love for you, all right? Why can't you get a great translation in the English language of, of hesed? Because it's a God word. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it really is. It's a, it's a God word. It's because it's a love that only God has. Mm -hmm. Mankind doesn't have this love, this chesed, that steadfast. We don't have that built into us. Right, right, right. And because we don't have it, it's a deficiency in mankind. And God came to take care of the deficiencies in mankind. What did he do? Romans 5, 5. He took his love and poured it into our hearts. It's all logical, isn't it? Yes. It's all logical when you stop and think about it. The love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Romans 5, 5. Because that's the only way you'll ever get this steadfast love. This love that has the power to love the unlovable, to love people without emotions, to, I mean, you know, to love people regardless of how they treat you. How can you love? How can Jesus demand? And that's what it is. It's not a suggestion. How can he demand that you love your enemies? Your enemies, by definition, are the people you don't like. One of his... They don't like you, you don't like them. That's what, by definition, right? Yes. How can God demand that you do this? Because he's given you the power to do it. More importantly, he's given you the love to do it. One of the things, I was in Exodus and going through it every morning. And in, in there once or twice it says if, if your enemy has uh, an, an animal that's in a ditch, help him get it out. Tell your enemy that he's got the animal there and help him get it out. Right. This, this is, you don't like the guy. He's your enemy. Or he's... You're not. You might not be his, but he's yours. Don't know, but yeah, you're supposed to him. help him get your that animal out and do something for him. That's an act right. of love, when, even though. Right. When, when, let me say this. When Jesus Christ says that you are to love your enemies, that presupposes that you have enemies. Yes. Yes, it does. Okay. And what you're talking about now is is something that really is important if you stop and think about it, because. What the, what the Word of God demands is not just this highfalutin love where you sit back in your tower and say, oh, I love that person. Right. This is action. a love that requires action. That's right. mm -hmm. This is a love that expresses itself in action. Because, you know, it says in Proverbs, that better is an open rebuke than the love unspoken. Love has to be expressed in action. For God so loved the world. You know this verse, John 3, 16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Uh, okay, you understand what this is? Yes, yeah. It requires that expression of action. Mm -hmm. You have to do something. So when God is saying that we are to love our enemies, I mean, we're, listen, not just exclusively our enemies, what it's saying, what it's saying is you're supposed to love the brethren and everybody else. Mm -hmm. That has to be okay. And, and I said before, what he talked about is it starts with the household of God. That talks about doing good. It starts with the household of God. It doesn't end with the household of God. We're supposed to do good to one another. You know what? Husband, your first responsibility is to love and do good with your wife. Mama and Papa, your next responsibility is do good and love your children. And then you're supposed to love the people that God has put you in fellowship with. And then you're supposed to love the entire body of Christ. And then you're supposed to love those outside the body of Christ, those people who are enemies, by definition, enemies of God. You know, again, this is, these thoughts are all going. One of the things that God created the world, 
for God so loved the world. God created the world. Yes. So everything God created, we should love. You're, you're right. It's a little scary thought right off the bat. Uh, right? He created Satan, and well, we, that love stops. Well, I, well, actually, we're, we're not talking we're about, not about, about spiritual. Spirit, yeah, we're talking God about God created the world. That's what I started with. I mean, that's right. a physical, tangible thing that you can touch and see. And one of the things it said here is for all people. Yes. Okay. But yeah, but I'm saying, but but he created all people. When. So we should be loved. That's what if if it's something God created. God created man. We should love man. We should love people. Yes, that wasn't your original statement. It's like everything he created. Well, yeah, I did say that, but I was thinking people. I was well, the the problem is what well, it, it goes beyond people. Yeah, it does. You know, it says in Proverbs that the righteous man cares for the life of his beasts. Yeah. You know, we should have that. We should have a love for. The things that God has created, yeah, not just the living stuff. The uh, trees, the flowers. The well, you know, it says that the trees are going to clap their hands yes, in Psalms yes, when yes, Jesus yes. returns, and the command of Jesus Christ when He left, the Great Commission, was to go out and preach the gospel to all creation. That's right. Now, I've not met many people in my life who actually take that verse seriously. That's right. However, there's there are people that I know. There are people that I know very well. There are people sitting at this table, and I'll not name any names who every time we go someplace wants me to take her to a zoo so she can go around and tell all this the animals true. that Jesus yeah. loves them. Hey, well that's the word, I can't, I can't argue with that. That's the word of God. Go preach the gospel to all creation. Absolutely. The problem is that if we, and, you know, listen, I'm not, and I'll use this expression although it's demeaning, I'm not a tree hugger. I'm not an environmentalist. However, having said that, I, I feel the pain of seeing what mankind has done. done to God's creation. That's right. And by the way, that is not new. It did not come with the industrial age. No. Because I will take you back to the prophet Isaiah who lived 750 years before Jesus Christ. And it says in Isaiah that the whole earth is polluted by the transgressions of men. Mm -hmm. Sin is the original pollution and sin stinks. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, that creation groans for the coming of the Lord. Yes, we, you know, we don't have a compassion. God, remember the ministry of man. The ministry of man was to take dominion and responsibility for God's creation. God created Adam, picked him up, and placed him in the Garden of Eden yes. to cultivate it, to grow it, to nurture it. Right? To make it make creation prosper. And what has mankind done rather than doing that? Well, we've made a mess of it, quite frankly. But that's, you know, I'm not, like I said, I'm not going to, this is not an environmentalist argument. It is a matter of us having that love of God. God, look down, you know, this is, think about it. God Almighty. We don't understand God Almighty. No. Don't, I, you know, we, we have an inherent major problem mm. in our lives, and that is, it is very difficult, if not impossible, for us to see God as something other than just a superhuman. Exactly. A very nice guy in the sky. Uh, okay. Yes. I'm just, okay. He is. Well, he is a nice guy in the sky, except he's not no, a guy. He, he is, is other. No, he, he is, is something, I mean, he is, you know, Paul talks about having gone, uh, and I think it's when he was stoned, by the way, not stoned drunk, I mean no, stoned, no. they tried to kill him that he saw paradise, yes. literally saw paradise, and he said no he, he couldn't speak it. Well, it wasn't that he couldn't speak it because God said, you know, not to talk about this. No, no. He couldn't speak about it because... He didn't have the vocabulary the, for it. You don't have the vocabulary to explain it's what it is. Here, was like John it. the Baptist's father was struck dumb? Well, that's because he, he didn't believe Gabriel. Right, right. but he couldn't talk. Yeah. I mean, um, Paul or Peter talking about... Uh, uh, have and had a much has about as much chance as well. Paul, yeah, couldn't do this it. This guy talking right. about what he saw right. in the angel. Right. That was, yeah. So right. so Paul, but it was an inability because he couldn't express what he There's saw. Nothing here. Okay. I just okay. I lost my train of thought. Yeah. Um, well, we're talking about God's creation, and he said it was good. Oh yes, God created the heavens and earth and looked down and said, it is good. 
Well, today he looks down at the earth and said, no, it's not so good. And that's why this present heaven and earth. Now remember, heaven was polluted too. Yes. By what? The transgressions of its, some of its inhabitants. Right. Because Satan led a rebellion mm -hmm. in heaven and was cast out of heaven. But heaven in the process is polluted. So there will be a new heaven and a new earth. This present earth, Peter says, is reserved for destruction by fire. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's as simple as that. You got this. God bless you. <coughs> Thank you. I like God's blessings. Okay. So, um, last week I said that, that faith that is shaken... Is not faith. Mm -hmm. That's right. Because faith is the assurance, right? Yes. Well, I'm going to say the same thing about love. love. Because love is not shaken. It's supposed to be steadfast. If it's not steadfast, um, maybe it's not love. Maybe it's just an emotion. Mm -hmm. Remember, we know... See, the problem is, there are millions of songs written about love. There are movies and television shows about love. And trust me, they virtually all get it wrong. What is love? If God is love, he's stable. Yes, God is stable. God, does not, God is not a man that he did, should change. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and yes, forever. There is that consistency and that stability. Well, and that is supposed to be the love in our lives. Is that It's supposed to be consistent and stable. It, it's not dependent upon whether somebody talked does nice to me now exactly. and didn't talk nice to me now. My love is not based on how they treat me at the moment, Did they my cheat love, me? right? Yeah. Uh, it, it's got to be that consistent. And if it's not bound by emotions and feelings, then I have the power to have that consistent love. Exactly. How do we? What? What is? I started to say. I mean, it's like, do you know love by the love songs? Do you know love by the romantic novels no, or movies? No. How do you know what love is? We know love by this. First John three sixteen that God gave up His life for us. That Jesus died on a cross. That's how we know what love is. Show me, show me the emotion and the feeling. Show me the frillies. Show me the flowers anymore. It's not about that stuff. It is about a choice made to give to others in spite of the way you feel about them. And just in spite of the way they've, you've been treated. In spite of the way you've been treated. Thus, love your enemies. But, you know, I'm not seeing that in the church. I'm seeing the church respond to the enemies. And, and this, this, it's a horrific thing, because more often than not, it has nothing to do with anything but, but nationalities and patriotism and, you know, how this country re reacts against that country. Uh, I want to tell you something. During the Second World War, you can go study this in history, uh, you know, America was saying God's on our side. Well, trust me, Germany was getting their people to say God's on their side. Every, God's on everybody's side. Want well, to know something? God's not, never on the side of, of, of wars in this day and age. Yeah. All right? That ended on Calvary. That's right? The deal is, we need to choose to exercise the love that we have. This hatred that I see in the church towards, and I don't care how fanatic a Muslim is. I don't care that he's a, a, a terrorist bomber. That's not, it's not a matter of liking what he does or approving. And I am not approving of their actions by any means. I'm not approving of the things that they believe in. It's not, it has nothing to do with that. There is this complete, you have to disconnect from, from actions, those things. From those actions. You've got to disconnect from those actions and say to yourself that Jesus Christ died on the cross for that person, for that Muslim, for that Buddhist, for that pagan, for that communist, for that whatever. Christ died on him, and he's never going to know that unless you tell him. And it's going to take the love of God inside of you to cause you to tell him that. The example that always comes back to my mind is Hyde Park. When you were, you went to 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 see what was right. going on. You you were invited up on a plat platform, and just at that time, a an imam came in with fifty or so of his followings. Mm -hmm. And the first thing out of your mouth is, "Come, let us reason together." Right. And you. You did reason with him from Scripture, and it was, I don't know if to say, it, it was, uh, how, how would you describe it? It's incredible, it's, wonderful. It's, it's confrontational, God. 
Yes, but, it was, but, but peaceful. Not, yes, yes. You know what? But it was, there was no, but there was I, no anger or, or. But last week I talked about. But but he loved that person. Yes, yes, yes. And last week I talked about confronting the world. When we preach the gospel, we are confronting the, the we're That's confronting right. the world. The word of God is confrontational, because the word yes. of God attacks the world system. Yes. But it doesn't attack the people. Exactly. It attacks because our warfare is not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. It goes back and, to yes, loving the and, person and, and, and that, sin. In that incident that Mark is talking about, and this goes back to one of our first trips to England many, many years ago, um, that this guy, this, this Muslim imam, was, I think, shocked, to yes. say the least, inasmuch as I wasn't attacking him. Exactly. Now, the Word of God says, come let us reason together. So I said to him, come let us reason together. And it's not that I was willing to agree with him, mm -hmm. nor was I willing to compromise with him, but I was willing to love him. Yes. And I was willing to not sure. want, I was willing to not want to harm him. Mm -hmm. I wasn't trying to destroy him. No. I was trying to draw him into a place to meet Jesus Christ. Because that's what it's all about. The relationship. A love so, relationship. You know, I don't think we can overemphasize those words. To love the brethren and all other people. Mm -hmm. I mean, and like I said, the goal of our instruction is love. We can come here week after week after week after week. The purposes of our Bible study is to grow in love. Mm -hmm. Period. That's right. Like I said, there may be other blessings along the way. It's like that trip. You may get a lot of blessings along the way. And that's fine. That's wonderful. But you've got to keep the goal in mind. It's about keeping your eye on the goal. As you ramble on through life, brother, whatever be your goal. Keep your eye upon the donut and not, and not upon the hole. What scripture verse is that again? <laughs> that's, that's the Mayflower the, Donut Shop. Yeah. That is not scripture. <laughs> no, no, but it's, it's good to understand because it says without vision people perish. Or, un or unrestrained, take your verse. But the point is, we have to have that vision and stay faithful to the vision. Stay fixed on it. What's the goal? The goal is love. God is love. Jesus Christ is love. Fix your eyes, it says in Hebrews, in Hebrews 12. Fix your eyes on Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. You've got to stay fixed on the goal. Yes, there's a lot of wonderful other things that happen along the way. And by the way, whether you think they're wonderful or not, I, I, I trust that you know, having read the Bible or come to Bible studies or whatever, that what, regardless of what you think of those things you encounter, you are to rejoice in them. That's right. You're considering them all joy, joy, to exalt in them. I mean, these are the things. Why? Because we know that it's only a step along the path to get to the place that we're going. And God has assured us that we will get to that place. Yes. I am put in mind of... Jesus Christ saying to his disciples, mm -hmm. get in the, I'm paraphrasing, yeah. get in the boat, we're going to the other side of the lake, to the Sea of Galilee, right? Get in the boat, we're going the other side. He didn't uh, tell them about what was on the way. No, what, he, what, what happened along the way was a storm arose, yes. a massive storm. Now, I would think that Matthew had a good reason to be scared. He's a tax collector. What's he doing out in the, uh, on the sea? Yeah. But Peter and Andrew and James, now, these are fishermen. They've been out on the sea all, or, and around the sea all their lives. This storm was so bad that they, they believed that they were perishing. Yeah. Well, they believed they were perishing. How do I know they believed they were perishing? Because they woke Jesus Christ up. That's how concerned he was. They woke him up and said to him, Don't you care that we're perishing? And he said to them, Oh, you of little faith. Why? Because he had said, we're going to the other side. And he watches over his word to perform. No matter what storms arise in the middle, remember that you serve a God who can stand up and say to the sea and the wind, peace, be still. But he will accomplish his purpose because he watches over his word to perform. If God has said you're going to get to the other side, if you get into that glory land, you're going to get there, regardless of what happens in the middle of the trip. This is why it's important to understand what it says, you know, what Solomon wrote when he said, the end of a matter is better than its beginning in Ecclesiastes. He doesn't tell you, it makes no guarantees about the middle, but he makes a guarantee on the end, right? Amen. And, and that's why, let me just say this again, without, that, why do we study the Bible? 
if you think that it's about getting a learning promise so you know what, what you deserve, you don't deserve anything. What? How rotten is that? You don't deserve anything but death. See, the wages of sin are death. You were born in sin. You were conceived in sin. You came into this earth in sin, and you were a sinner. You were a dirty, rotten sinner. Oh, I never did nothing wrong. Want to know something? Yes, you did. Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It is the gift of God. Salvation is the free gift of God. Not of works, so any man should boast. So we've all sinned. We've all done these things that are wrong. We've all done that. But God, by His grace, has poured out His love into us and drawn us into salvation. You know better than the other guy walking down the street. You know, don't let foolish pride get in the way and, and make you believe that you are better than that dirty, rotten sinner who's out doing drugs on a street corner or doing all these abominable things. I'm not going to sit here and name all those abominable things because we're not supposed to. But the fact of the matter is, you don't deserve salvation any more than that person does. There's an eloquent way of saying that. There by the grace of God go on. Yeah. There, yeah. There but for the, but there for the, but for the grace, grace of God go on. Yeah. Now, you know, don't think that you have salvation because you deserve it. Okay? You've got salvation because of the magnificence of the glory of the love of God. And it's a free gift. It's a gift. It's a gift. It was you given to you. You right. didn't earn it. You didn't earn it. Not of works, lest any man should boast. If you got it because you deserved it, that's wages, right? It's uh, you. I, I'm not going to spend more time on that because, my goodness, if you are saved by the shed blood of the Lamb, and if you have spent you any time at the foot it. of the cross, you you need you must know that. All right, love. Let me just. I, we're going to get out of time here. I don't want to do that. But look at this that verse again and think about. Okay, let me go back here. Um, so that you may establish your hearts without blame and holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Love is what makes your heart blameless. What, what do you think makes you blameless? You know, it says in Isaiah that God will wash us white as snow, white with his, with his love, right? It's the shed blood of Jesus Christ that has made us clean. But it's God's love that made your heart blameless. But it's your love that keeps you blameless. And it's about your heart. What do you think? I mean, you really think it's, a, it's about... Um, when Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, He said, Many will come to me on that day, talking about the final day, the day of judgment. And he said, Many will come to me on that day, saying, Lord, Lord, look what I did in your name. And they'll start to rattle off all the deeds, the works that they did here. And He says, Depart from me, you evil ones. I never knew you. Do you think it's because he kept a log of all the things they did or didn't do? Or is it because he sees what's in their heart? And what's in their heart is pride. Because they have come into the presence of the risen Savior. And they start talking about themselves. Okay? The true saints get a crown and they toss those crowns. Yeah. And it's but... but, but you, I, I'm sure you know, I'm not sure, you probably know this verse. 1 Samuel 16, 7. The Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. That's, for God sees not as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord searches, looks at the heart. So when these guys come, or these people come to, to Jesus on that day and say, Lord, it's not about the, a book, that, a tally that was kept. It's about he's searching their heart right then, right there. And you know what he doesn't find? He doesn't find that all-consuming love for him. He doesn't find that all-consuming love for the Father. Because this, is, of course, is the first command. You shall love the Lord your God. Well, how much? With all, right? That's not what he finds. He finds his self-love. He searches the heart. Love is what makes your heart blameless. And like I'm going to go back and say it again because it's so important. It's not the love that you can build up. It's not the love that you can think up. It is 
recognizing that God's love dwells within you. For you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. And releasing God's love in your life. Don't force it. And don't feel bad if in the process of trying to do this, you know, you go out and you share the gospel and you, and you look at this person and you don't like them. Don't feel bad. It's not about the way you feel. It's about the, what you choose to do. Don't feel condemned because the devil is, is an accuser of the brethren. So when you start to act in love against people, I'm going to tell you, the devil's going to come along and say, well, you don't really love that person. You don't really love that person. You do, you do. No, you don't really like that person. Because there's a difference between liking and loving. And God is calling you to love the unlikable. So don't get condemned because even when you're starting to love or try to act in the love of God towards people, if all you know, instantly you don't start liking them. Instantly you don't have these feelings and emotions of, towards that person. Don't worry about that. I'm sure Paul didn't love the Jews, but he prayed for the Jews. He didn't love some of them because they were the yeah. ones coming after him. Right. So, but you have the power to do that. You can do that. I promise you, you can do that. Okay, I'm going to get into this, and I'm not, I don't think we're going to be able to finish this up because of the time. But he talks about here, um, in 13, you're going to have, without blame or holiness before our God and Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all the saints. I want you to know, and we'll talk about this more, I promise you, in the coming weeks, well, a lot more, because Paul's letters to the Thessalonians are definitely end times letters. There is a focus throughout both of his letters, first and second Thessalonians, on the coming of Jesus Christ on the final day, on that great day that in Hebrew is called Hayom Yahweh, the day of Yahweh. I just like the way that sounds. Hayom Yahweh, hallelujah. But there is an absolute focus on the coming of Jesus Christ. And let me just say this in this day and age. You should be aware that Jesus Christ could come at any time. I mean, things are going on in this world today. Now, there have been times, there have been chaotic times in history. I recognize that. There have been many times in history where people have said, well, this is the end, you know, be, beware, uh, you know, repent, repent, the end is near. Well, listen, repent, the end is near. Um, I, I can't, I'm not going to be like that guy, Blessed. let him be nameless, yeah. who keeps saying, you know, he can put a date on when Jesus Christ is coming back because you can't do that. No. Um, but the signs are there, and Jesus... If you, if you wanted a little exercise, a little homework, go back and reread or read for the first time if you've never done it, Matthew 24. Because this was a question that the disciples had. And the disciples came to Jesus Christ and said, Tell us, what will be the signs of your coming and the end of the age? So Matthew 24 is actually Jesus responding to that exact question and saying, Okay, here's what you can expect to see, and these will be the signs of my coming and the end of the age. Did we do about a Bible study on that? Uh, years ago, we did. Yeah. Yeah. It's not recorded no, 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 on no, no, that, Yeah, that was before we started doing any of this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and if you look at those things, and then, and then understand where we are today, the prophecies, and let me just tell you this, a hundred years ago, it could not have happened because enough of the prophecies had not been fulfilled. One of the primary prophecies that had to be fulfilled was the reestablishment of Israel as the nation of the Jews. Well, that happened. It happened within my lifetime. Now, I may be old and getting older, and you are too, uh, and I'm older than most, but it, that within my lifetime, Israel has been reestablished as a nation, and the prophecies are that all nations shall come against Israel. Um, if you look at what's going on in the world, the chaos of the present world, the economic chaos, the military chaos, Look what's going on in Iran, and, you know, all I can say to you is this. Remember the old Boy Scouts of Bureau of Boy Scout? I'm old enough for that. Be prepared. Be ready in season and out. If you are walking uprightly, and we'll talk about that in Paul's letter here next week for sure. If you're walking uprightly, and you have nothing to fear, just keep that lamp lit, brother, and be ready. Be looking up, for your salvation draws near. So hallelujah. Father, we just thank you. We thank you, Lord God, 
that there is an appointed time for every event. There is an appointed time, Father, that you and you alone know for your son's return. But help us to be prepared. And Father, give us a sense of urgency to reach out to a lost and dying world, that we would proclaim your love to them, that they would be there and delivered from the wrath that is to come that Paul talked about in this letter. Help us to be faithful in bringing your love, not only to our brothers and sisters, not only to our own families, but bringing your love, God, to all the people. I thank you for being with us. I'm blessed that you are here with us, and hope you can be back again next week. God bless you. Your word is a comfort to my soul. Your word is the truth that sets me free. Is a light into my path. Your word is a lamp into my feet.